Look at your neighbor and tell him he is risen. I love the words that Travis Green wrote because he got up. I can get up again. Tell your other neighbor because he got up. I can get up again. Oh, yeah, you may be down this morning. You may got some stuff going on. You may feel like you're in a gutter. You may be doing push-ups under a nickel this morning. But I guarantee you that because of what Christ did on the cross, and we're going to talk about what he went through in a few minutes, but we're going to turn to Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, chapter 24. Luke was a physician. He was very detailed in his account of the life of Jesus, and here he's bringing into account what happened after the crucifixion. And we're going to talk about the crucifixion in a few minutes. But I'm going to start reading in verse 1 of chapter 24, Luke's Gospel. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other with, women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Look at your neighbor, tell them they couldn't find Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid, look at your neighbor and say they were afraid. They were scared. They bowed their faces to the earth. They said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Oh, my God. Remember how he spoke to you. Look at your neighbor again. Tell him, what did he speak to you? You got to remember. You got to remember. Tap him on the shoulder. Tell him, you got to remember what he spoke to you. What he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Hallelujah. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women, plural, with them who told these things to the apostle, the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales. They did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what happened. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Stay standing. We're going to pray. Father God, I thank you so much today for your holy word that is anointed. God, I thank you that if anyone is hearing the sound of my voice, regardless of what they're going through today, God, I thank you that you are risen. God, I thank you that you have a plan and you have a purpose for every life, every man, woman, and boy in this room. Thank you that I decrease today, that you increase. Thank you that your name is lifted up today that what you did the truth of the sacrifice that you paid so we can stand here and be free from sin and iniquity and demonic spirits oh god and addictions oh god thank you that we remember the price that you paid for us we bless you we honor you in jesus name all god's people said you may be seated in the presence of the lord I want to title the message today, this resurrection morning, as a question. Are you looking for Christ in dead places? Are you looking for Christ in dead places? These women have been through tremendous trauma, tremendous grief, as they have watched, as they watched their Lord, their Savior die a brutal death. They expected to come to the tomb and find a dead body laying there. 
But instead of finding Jesus, instead of being able to offer the sacrifices, the scripture said that they prepared spices. It was the tradition to embalm the body with spices. Joseph of Arimathea, when Jesus was crucified and died, offered his tomb as the place where Jesus would lie. And at that time, they did anoint his body. Uh, as many of us know, even in modern days, the body is embalmed. But these women came later to add extra, extra spices and extra embalming. They had been personal friends and confidants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet when they got to the tomb, what they expected to find, who they expected to find, what they expected to find, was not there. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you had prepared and planned to achieve a goal of what you thought was the right thing to do? And when you got to your destination, Jesus was nowhere to be found. Oh my God. See, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, no gender, to a man and a woman, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 14 Verse 12, Luke 24 records that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, they had planned to rise early, and they went to their destination. But at that moment, the body of Jesus was gone. Have you ever come to a place in your life when you felt like all your plans and preparation, blood, sweat, and tears, and best efforts ended with disappointment, loss, fear, and death? And the fulfillment of visions, hopes, and dreams you had for your life had hit a dead end. Am I the only one here today? The Bible describes these women as being greatly perplexed, confused. Have you ever felt that way, my brothers and sisters? Just perplexed, scratching your head, wondering what in the world did I do wrong? Where did I miss it? Praying and holding your head, uh, laying awake at night, mind racing, having to take anti-acids because the stress is affecting your body, trying to figure out what happened and realizing you've arrived at a dead place in your life. Pastor taught Wednesday, not all storms are dead places are due to our own fault or our own sin. Look at Job, who was blameless and yet faced death all around him. In one night, his whole family, all his children were dead. But that's not what I'm dealing with today. I'm saying the women went around looking for Christ in an empty tomb because they did not take heed to what he had spoken to them earlier. Let's think about this for a moment. These women were no strangers to Christ. Uh, the woman of God knew Jesus intimately and had walked with him, and the Bible records had supported his ministry financially. Mary Magdalene was the woman who received deliverance personally from Jesus. Luke 8, 3 says that she had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. She'd been delivered from severe psychological and emotional trauma. Joanna was one of the women Jesus had cured of an incurable disease. And Mary was the mother of James, one of Jesus' closest and most trusted disciples. They knew him. They knew him. They knew him. They were familiar with him. They knew Jesus. You can know Jesus, my brothers, my sisters. You can know him. You can walk with him and still take a left turn in your life. They had walked with Jesus intimately, but they had prepared for a moment that didn't turn out as expected. After the trauma and the grief and the fear, has anybody ever been through some trauma and some grief? Oh, come on. I know I've been through some trauma and some grief and some fear. And when you came to that point in your life, you realized that Jesus could not be found. The Roman soldiers had brutally tortured and killed Jesus. And they had come, these women had come to grips with the fact that the place they thought they would find Jesus was not where he was. Can you imagine going to the gravesite 
of one of your closest loved ones just three days after you buried them and finding the grave dug open, the casket gone, and the burial clothes you had hand-picked laying at the bottom of an open grave. Can you imagine that? Wanting just one more intimate moment with the one who was your everything, surrounded by a cemetery and symbols and reminders of your death and grief. All of us, like the women at the tomb of Christ, have made the mistake of making plans for our lives, expecting the end to turn out a certain way, but we forgot, we neglected, and some of us have even disobeyed God's word and are now dealing with the consequences of dead places in our lives. The angels showed up the third day after Christ's crucifixion and had to remind the women at the tomb of Jesus that despite their best intentions, they forgot what Jesus told them. He wasn't staying in the grave. He was going to get up. What did God tell you? What did God tell you this morning that you might have forgotten? What promises are you str still struggling to believe after all these years? What about commands from God's word that you have disobeyed? Or maybe you're just in rebellion toward, or maybe you've become lackadaisical toward God's word and are compromising your life in the truth. I want to submit to you, precious people of God, that the Lord sent you this morning to remind you of his word. It really doesn't matter how you got here. Uh, myself included, standing in front of you, I has dead places in his life, and we all desperately need to remember what God has forget said. Let me clarify what I, when I speak of dead places. I'm not referring to geographical locations. I'm, not I'm talking about habits, hang-ups, mindsets, besetting sins, and weights that we battle in our minds. Oh, you can move to Houston. You can move to New York City. Uh, you can move to Los Angeles. And you can still take dead places with you. We say, I need a fresh start. My boss is tripping. That man or that woman is tripping. But how many know you can go to a different man and you can go to a different woman? But if you got dead places in your mind and dead places in your attitude, you can go to a different job. You can move across to another side of town. You can move from the projects to a $300,000 home. But if your mindset is still the same, I want to take a few brief moments to look at three places that we go that lead to death. First place, the place called I will. Uh, we tend to look at pride, which is I will is pride. We tend to look at pride as rocking around with our nose stuck up in the air. But when you break down pride in Scripture, it is as simple as saying in your heart, I will. Isaiah 14, 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground. You are weakened, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. One of the early church fathers, Augustine, said it was pride that changed angels into devils. The Lord's Prayer in Luke 11 says, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. How many in the room have said, oh, I'll forgive him, I'll forgive her, and I'll even forgive that other person, but how many in the room today, this morning, April 21st, had said, I will not forgive that person. I will ascend above what God said. A true follower of Christ will do. There have been periods of my life where I have been betrayed. 
There have been periods of my life where I've been slept around on. There have been periods of my life where people have walked away from me. There have been periods of my life when people were abusive toward me and said all kinds of nasty things about me behind my back. And I was tempted in those moments to say, I will not forgive. There have been seasons of my life where the hurt and the pain and the wounds that I have received, I'm going through something right now, would tempt me to say, I will not forgive. But when Jesus said in his answer to disciples, how should we pray? How should we interact? How should we not just do church, as we say around here, but actually live Christ? How should we do that? Jesus said, the first thing, when you pray and you ask for forgiveness, the requirement is that you must first forgive. You got to let it go. If you and I, I and you, were honest enough, many of us have lost it, crashed and burned, had relationships, gone south. And at times we have said, I will. We need Jesus to take the wheel this morning. The first step in the Christian recovery program called Celebrate Recovery is this. We admitted that we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors. You can feel anything else in there. Our unforgiveness, our anger, our temper, Oh, yeah, thank you, Holy Ghost. Our temper, our temper, our temper, where we feel justified to lose our temper. We're talking about dead places this morning, beloved. Areas where seemingly Christ should be because we call ourselves a Christian. But when we look around us, there's chaos and death 360 degrees around us. I remember when the Lord dealt with me about my temper. Yes, this square from Delaware had a temper. And we can get addicted to the adrenaline that comes. Listen to me, people of God. We can get addicted to the adrenaline and we can begin to justify our words that are cutting and crucifying and leaving our family and our children bleeding. Whew, my God. Oh, we're going to pick you up in a minute, but Jesus came to take the wheel of our life. The third step says we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. To receive and com complete deliverance from the I will place in our life. To receive complete deliverance from the I will place in our life. We must be willing to hand over, it's a C word, control. For those of us in the room that have gone through abandonment, for those of us in the room that have gone through abuse, for those of us in the room have come up in dysfunctional families, for those of us in the room that have all kinds of mind, psychological, emotional problems, for many of us in the room to be able to give up control that was once taken from us, that was once snatched from us, to give up control is to give up your very life. That's why you can sit in church for 10 years, 20 years. Give your tithes and offerings. 
You can even read your Bible. I did it. And be addicted to I will. And as one of the pastors shared with me this morning, you can have areas of your life that are doing so well, but there's other areas you step in and it's nothing but a dark tomb. A tomb of depression, a tomb of anger, a tomb of broken promises and broken relationships. Oh, and your kids don't want to talk to you. They don't even want to be around you because I will. In John 12, verse 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We want control. We want to control our life. We want to say give dictation to the Lord of what I will do and what I will not do. We want to tell him, somebody said a few months ago last year we have salad bar Christianity. We want to pick and choose the areas, the scriptures that we want to obey. Abraham in Genesis heeded the voice of his wife Sarah to have a child of promise in their old age and took matters in his own hands. I will. And he made the decision to sleep with Hagar, his wife's servant, to try to speed up the process of receiving his promise. This situation ended up mocking Abraham and Sarah and becoming a curse instead of a blessing. What am I saying? Many of us can create Ishmael's in our life because we have said, I will instead of thy will be done. Todd Delaney said this in one of his songs, I stepped down from the throne of my heart, saying all I am, it was yours from the start. Casting down my crown at your feet, all I am is yours. The missionary Jim Elliott made this statement weeks before he was martyred for his faith ministering to natives in South America, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm going to say it again. The man of God gave his life for Christ. They, they speared him. He is no fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God. Jim Elliot said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep, your life. You can't keep it. Every time you try to keep it, every time I've tried to keep it, I mess it up. Every time I try to do my will, every try, time I try to go on my plan, every time I try to be, start a business or do something or try to launch out in something, with my will, I lose every time. To gain what you cannot keep. To lose what you cannot keep, to gain what you cannot lose. No greater love was this, that a man lays down his life for a friend. My God, Jesus laid down everything. I don't know about you, I'm 47 years old. I just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And guess what? It takes saying, thy will be done. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Bishop Jakes just wrote an incredible book about crushing. Hours before he was crucified, hours before he died a bloody, torturous death. Prayed these prayers as drops of blood were sweat out of him. He said, Lord... He looked up to the Father and said, God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. I don't want to go through it. All my brothers and sisters, listen, there are Christians overseas right now. They're having their necks and their heads taken off. 
no, I'm not trying to be unkind, and we don't want to come and help and volunteer on a Saturday. We have Christians overseas that are being right now crucified like Jesus was for the faith. But our flesh wants to do its own thing. Second point, the place called I love. We've got iPhones. We've got iPads. Our culture is about I. It's about me, myself, and I. The second place of death is what I call I love, which is self-centered love or idolatry. Matthew 6, 24 says we cannot serve two masters. We're going to either hate one and love the other <laughs> or we're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5 says this, but know this in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I love. I have a form of godliness, but denying its power. Listen to this. And from such people, turn away. See, it was the custom of some ancient dictators during the time of Jesus to punish prisoners by tying a dead body to the back of the one being punished. That rotting, decomposing dead body would eventually kill the one having to carry that dead person on their back. I wonder how many of us are carrying dead people, dead places, dead things around on our back. Things that Christ died for us to be 100% free from. The same blood that saves you is the same blood that can deliver you from sin. I wonder how many of us are walking around every day. You can't see it physically. We look good on the outside. A lot of us, boy, you're looking good this morning, people of God. We're dressed up, our hair did. We got ties and suits on and handkerchiefs and the ladies got new shoes and we look good on the outside. But Jesus said in Matthew 23, uh, you brood of vipers, you're full of dead man's bones. Church, I don't want to be unkind, but the Bible says that the truth, you will know it. You will become intimately aware of the truth and the truth will make you free. Are some of us walking around in life with a dead body? Are some of us laying in bed with a dead body? Are some of us sitting on the phone with a dead body? Are some of us intimately entwined with dead people, places, and things that the Apostle Paul said, depart, come out from the unclean thing? I know it's not popular. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You know, the beautiful thing about joy, when you saw the worship happening, <laughs> when you die, when I die to our flesh, we allow Christ to be resurrected in our life. When we talk about joy unspeakable, I got joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about how he set me free. I could dance, dance. You know, when you don't have freedom, when you haven't been delivered, there is no joy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, you can walk around. You can have the nicest car in town. Oh, my God. You can have the biggest bank account in the country. Oh, they're bo blowing their brains out every day. People that have all the world's trappings but don't have Christ. 
James 1 says this, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That when that has desired, has given full birth, it gives birth to sin, and when it is full grown, brings forth death. Jesus said this, the church is not a place for those who think they are healthy. The, Pharise the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day uh, hated Jesus. Because Jesus spoke the truth. A few years ago, I had a revelation, and it kept me up. <laughs> it bothered me. I had a revelation of how long hell is. Oh, I'm going to pick you up in a second. There's good news. There's good news. I'm telling you there's good news today. I had a revelation of how long forever is. See, we're finite beings, and when our mind tries to understand, now Ecclesiastes says, Minister Christian, that eternity uh, is placed in the heart of man. We understand that we're going to live forever. We really do. But I began to get an understanding of Hold on, there's no end? I'm used to getting up, brushing my teeth, taking a shower, putting my clothes on, and then at some point the day ends. <laughs> Many of you <laughs> have been in relationships that were seemingly like hell. I said it. And you were glad when that thing came to a... I know anybody that's had pain issues. Several of the sisters have had recent surgeries and pain, pain, pain. And once, immediately after surgery, you're getting all these pain pills and to dull the pain. And thank God, as you get further away from the surgery, the pain subsides. But can you imagine no end? See, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a field and there's a, my God, there's a pearl buried in the field. No one knows it's there. And he goes and he sells everything to buy the field. No one knows there's a pearl there. He sells everything. How many of us know the pearl is there? But we're still out spiritually working a nine-to-five job when God has an inheritance in heaven that will last forever. No crying, no tears no sadness, and yet we're sleeping and we're entwined with dead things. Last point, the place called I hid. The place called I hid, it's fear. Genesis 3.10 says this, and they heard the sound of the Lord. This is Adam and Eve after they had fallen from grace. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Matthew 25, 25, the parable of the talents. The one servant buried his talent. And when the master came back and asked for interest on what he had given to the servants, the servant that had been given one talent answered, I was afraid and I went 
and hid your talent in the ground. Some of us are not living the life that God has called us to, not because of sin, but because of fear. We're hiding. I thank God for my spiritual father, Pastor Lawrence Peoples. <laughs> some of us that have been abandoned, some of us that have had rejection issues, we hide. When there's a problem, we stick our head in the sand. We hide our head. We hide our awareness. <laughs> We hide from the truth, my God. We hide from facing and confronting what needs to be confronted. Adam and Eve had done what God specifically told them not to do. And because of shame. See, there's a difference between conviction and shame. Conviction uh, has to do with knowing that you are wrong. Shame has to do with believing you as a person are wrong. Your whole being is wrong. For years I've dealt with, <laughs> I'm just wrong, I'm just a mistake. I know there's some in the room, I know by the Holy Ghost, I'm just a mistake. I'm not going to be blessed. I'm hiding from God. I'm hiding from getting to know people. I'm hiding from connecting. I didn't want to get in a 12 group or a small group. I'm hiding because I don't want anybody to really know who I really am. And when people start standing up in discipleship and sharing, I came out that they came out of prostitution or drug addiction or pornography or whatever it may be, when they began to share openly and not hide, you took a step back. Every one of us in the room have skeletons in our closets and stuff up under our rug. And Revelation said, behold, Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. If you'll let me in, I'll come in and I'll sup with you. I'll have dinner with you. God wants to bond with you. God wants to deliver you. God wants to forgive you. God wants to heal you. God wants to take what has been a mess and turn it into progress. God wants to take your yesterday that has been a mess and turn your tomorrow into success and blessing. I want to close with this. There's one more I, and that is I am. I am is not a place. I am is a person. John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection, and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. <laughs> the moment Christ gave up the ghost in Matthew 27, 50, when the earthquake shook the earth, the veil was torn, and after the resurrection, believers in Christ who had passed away and were buried in tombs rose out of their graves and were seen walking around. Moses, when he had the burning bush experience, when he asked, who should I say sent me? Moses said, Moses received an answer from God, and God said, I am. I am. He's everything. I know some of us have been taught it doesn't take all that. Some of us have been taught be balanced. You're getting too radical and crazy about Jesus. You're becoming a Jesus freak. You're st becoming strange. I don't know about you, but it's very strange. When God steps out of eternity 
And when I'm sitting in the seat of the accused and the jury has found me guilty and when the judge has sentenced me to death by legal injection, that act after I am tried and convicted and found guilty, that the judge stands up, takes off his robe. gets down out of his high place. And instead of me getting the handcuffs put on me to be led away to my death, the judge comes down and pushes me aside and says, I'll go for him. I'll die. I'll take the penalty. I'll take the penalty. Come on, think about it. I'll take the penalty. Every mistake you've made, every sin you've committed, I'll take the penalty. I'll take the penalty. Mark's account of the cross emphasizes Christ's agonizing suffering death, suffering and death. The cross was Christ's response to man's need of a redeeming Savior. The cross was a Roman form of execution, symbolizing that the one who died in such a fashion was cursed. That's what I was referring to earlier. I felt like I was cursed. There are several in here. I know by the Holy Ghost, you feel and you believe that you are cursed. You believe that everything that you've tried to do in life, that the family that you're from, that the mistakes that you have made, that the addictions that you're dealing with right now indicate that you are cursed. Well, guess what? Sin is a curse. But the Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us. The cross, after Jesus was falsely accused by the ecclesiastical council, he was brought before Pilate for judgment. Pilate did seek to release Jesus, but ultimately he gave in to the pressure from the crowd and ordered Jesus to be crucified. Can you imagine what it was like for the supreme of judge of the universe to be judged by humans? My God. Pilate further ordered Jesus be flogged with a whip with tips of metal and bone attached to the leather. Every one of the 39 lashes he received tore the flesh from his back. But with every blow, the price was being... The price was being paid for all the sickness and pain of lost humanity. Jesus, however, willingly, 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 willingly bore the pain. The shame of this horrible lashing, every stripe, that's when we, some of you haven't been in church a long time, when you hear, well, how am I healed by the stripes of Jesus? Because every time he took that lashing and blood was flowing, every time he, he whipped, every time they spit and ridiculed him, every time they pulled his beer out, beard out, it was for your healing. It was for your return to dignity. Next, a crown of thorns was pressed upon his precious head. These were not the little thorns we're used to seeing on rose bushes, but long two-inch thorns that penetrated his skull, causing him to bleed profusely. His head began to swell. Some of you in the room, you can play softly, Christian. We're about to close. Some of you in the room. I was praying this morning, and the Lord shared with me, there are several in the room that you have been honestly and seriously considering suicide, taking your life. And when those thorns were pressed into the head of Jesus. God himself took the punishment. Just like many of you in the room, the mental anguish that you go through on a daily basis. Oh, I'm, I'm telling you, I know what I'm saying is right. I don't hear a lot of amens, but that's all right. The mental anguish that no one knows about.
the thorns, the thorns, the thorns. He took it for you so you could be free. Isaiah says in Isaiah 52, verse 14, that his appearance was so disfigured, he was not even recognizable. After all this terrible pain, he was forced to carry his own cross. Physically, he was unable to bear the weight. Physically, many in the room, you're unable to bear the weight any longer. Now, I'm not being overly dramatic or emotional. I, I used to work in a mental health facility. I used to work in a hospital. I would see little kids coming in. I worked in hospice. I had to deal with the grief and pain of people in their 30s dying, being told you have pancreatic cancer and two weeks later they're gone. Jesus said, focus not on the things which are seen. The cars, your 401k. I'll tell you, we're going to celebrate in a minute. The Bible says all creation rejoices when even one soul. The angels rejoice when even one soul. Remember, I told you, I, had, I didn't finish the story. I had a revelation of what it was like to be separated from God forever. I thought about it. 10 years, 20 years, I'm 47. I can't hardly think back to when I was one. I don't remember. A thousand years? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. There's a message out there that says heaven, hell is not real. But Jesus paid the ultimate price. He, he's the pearl of great price. <laughs> I told the Lord this week, uh, I'm not going to hold anything back. See, see, some of you here preaching that says, oh, it's going to be all candy and peaches and roses when you walk with Christ. It's a lie. But we will reign with him. And those that are under the sound of my voice today, you are accountable for what you're hearing today. What does that mean? That you know the truth now. Yeah, the church in China, they've got one little Bible, one little page. And the church in China is exploding. No money. No lights. But they're hungry to know the God on one page of the Bible. We have a city, the murder rate is going up. It makes me weep, I see women walking through our parking lot, selling their bodies for a, a few dollars. That could be one of my daughters. We've got men to carry his own cross. Physically he was unable to bear the weight. Just like many of you, if you want to get real and honest, you're physically alive. Your, your, your heart is beating. But you're carrying death around. Finally arriving at Calvary, the spotless Lamb of God. Whew. 
was nailed to a rough wooden cross, bearing the sins of all mankind, hanging naked. I know the pictures look, they dress it up. He was naked. He was beaten beyond belief. And he bore the humiliation. And he had to endure the mocking of the crowd like many of you in your life have had to endure the mocking. And someone saying, you're not worth anything. You're not going to amount to anything. You've had to endure. And Christ on the cross took it all. Bearing the penalty. It's true the actions of men contributed to Jesus' death. But we must never forget that it was God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross in payment for our sins. I love at the end of the portion of Luke that we read, Peter came in and looked, and some of the Gospels record that the, the grave closed. The grave closed. It actually records that they were folded up neatly. Jesus said, no one takes my life. No, 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 see, 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 people want to say that you're some weak, sissy Christian. No, 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 no. He said, no one take, no one took my life. No one took my life. I lay down my life on my own accord. If I, if I, they were mocking him, they were mocking him. And he said, if I, I, I would just have to say one word to my father, 10,000 angels would show up with swords of fire. And yet some did not believe. I want to give an opportunity today. Jesus laid it down and he walked away. And further in Luke, you look, he wasn't in the tomb, but he was walking down the road, discipling. Yeah, 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 we're about discipleship here. He laid down his death. He, he had to do it, but he left it right there, and he kept pushing. Some of you, you find yourself at a dead end. Oh, yeah, including the preacher standing before you. I got some... I got some I got some stuff that because I hid and because I didn't deal with some stuff, I'm dealing with a dead end right now. Some of us have some I will places in our life. Some I love. I, I, it might be I love money. It might be I love you fill in the blank. But Jesus died so that you could walk away from that grave and that dead place and have life everlasting. Everyone stand to your feet. Lord, I said what I believe you asked me to say. And I thank you for this moment. God, I thank you that you're beginning to make this church look like heaven. Revelation 5.9, Revelation 7.9 said there'll be a sea in heaven of every tribe, nation, and tongue. He's not coming for a black church. He's not coming for a white church. He's not coming for a democratic church. He's not coming for a republican church. He's coming for a church whose garments, Revelation says, have been washed clean. And God, I thank you that this church is beginning to look like heaven. And Lord, I thank you for the man and the woman that are sitting, sitting here right now that are saying, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Preacher, I hear what you're saying. But you don't know my story. 
Yeah, I hear you. It's easy to say I'll forgive, but you don't know what he did to me. Well, you're right. But God, I thank you that you are the one that knows. And you are the one that understands. And you have been touched with the infirmities of every person in this room, the pain of every person in this room, the disappointment, the dead places. Father God, I thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit now. And I want to ask, if anybody's in the room, I just want to ask you to come forward quickly. If you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior and Master of your life, and you, you might not have even planned to do this today, but you say, I want to know him. I want to surrender and sell out to what Jesus has done for me. I want you to come quickly to the front and just stand here before me. Come quickly. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. Do not let fear keep you. Do not let your will keep you. Thank you, Lord. There's more. Come, 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 come. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There are those in the room that you're like the Pharisees. You've been a Christian outwardly, but you know in your heart that I need to become a disciple. A disciple, one that denies himself and picks up the cross. And you know you have some I wills. You have some I love places. And you have some I hid places. I want you to come. And we want to pray together. Come. 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 This is going to be a historic moment. This is going to be a historic moment for, for some of you. lift your hands. God loves you. For the Lord would say, I have called you and I have known you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I know the very number of hairs upon your head. And no, you're not a reject. No, you're not unloved. For I saw you when I gave my life on the cross. And today I call you to myself. And my word says, unless I draw you, you cannot come. But I say today, I am drawing you. My daughter, I am drawing you, my son. I am drawing you away from the thing that would kill you. And I'm drawing you to life for I am the resurrection and I am the life. And if you would find me, you would find life. So, Father, we thank you that we confess to you that we need you. Just say these words after me. Lord Jesus. I recognize who you are. There is zero confusion today. And in this moment, I turn away from my will and I choose your will. I've been trying to do it on my own and I've been crashing and burning and I'm asking you to come and heal my life. My life has become unmanageable and I give up control today 100%. I give it all to you and I ask you to come and heal my heart. Heal my life. Heal my shortcomings and make me a son of God and a daughter of God. In Jesus' name, I turn away from the devil. I turn away from dead things. 
and I turn to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, clap your hands together.